On this channel I've made many videos on invasive species. This is often a very controversial topic, and in most cases problems with invasive species are very complicated. Some people view invasive species as evil creatures, but of course this is simply not the case and they are just trying to survive. Of course certain introduced and non-native species can have massive negative impacts on non-native ecosystems, but in most cases they're outside of their natural range because of us humans. Over the past 500 years, invasive species have caused a third of all animal extinctions, and they've also cost millions of dollars in damages. This is why many introduced and invasive species aren't the most popular animals, and in some places around the world they have been villainized. This is simply the wrong way to look at this issue, because not only are some invasive species threatened themselves, but one of the worst invasive species in the world could be sitting right next to you. Cats are famously one of the worst invasive species in the world, and have led to some animals becoming endangered, and have even led to some animal extinctions. Despite this, we don't treat them any differently, and of course they receive a lot of love. In some rare cases, introduced and invasive species can be beneficial to non-native ecosystems. This means that not all invaders are bad, and although some creatures can negatively affect an ecosystem, they can also help it too. I have covered this topic in a past video, but I have been asked to revisit it, so today I will be going through three species that are beneficial to non-native ecosystems. And to start off our story, we will be heading over to beautiful Bermuda. Now Bermuda is of course a very beautiful island territory, and is situated in the North Atlantic Ocean. These islands have an interesting history with nature, and historically it's been a paradise for birds. The second rarest seabird on the planet can be found here, and this is of course the Bermuda petrel. As I've covered in a previous video, for 300 years this bird was thought to be extinct, but it was dramatically rediscovered in 1951. Since then it's made a breathtaking recovery, yet it is still listed as endangered. Conservationists have been working tirelessly to protect these birds, but unfortunately not all of the native birds have been able to make it to the present day. The Bermuda night heron used to patrol Bermuda's coasts, but it's been extinct for hundreds of years. This bird had a relatively large skull, and also very robust hind limbs. These were thought to be helpful adaptations to help them feed on their prey, which mostly came in the form of the island's land crabs. It's thought that this bird possibly went extinct in the 17th century, and human settlement was thought to be the reason behind this. This is around the time that humans settled on the islands, and of course the settlers destroyed their habitat, and also fed on the birds directly. With the night herons gone, the land crabs were able to expand, and soon their numbers were out of control. These crabs tend to build burrows on land, and this of course causes damage to properties. Strangely, Bermuda is also known as a golfer's paradise, and there are plenty of golf courses across the islands. These land crabs ruin the golf courses, and after the extinction of the native night heron, the growing land crab numbers started to concern the government. To find a solution they didn't have to look far, as the Bermuda night heron has a very close relative, and this is of course the yellow crowned night heron. This bird is one of two night herons that can be found in the Americas, the other being the black crowned night heron. These birds prefer shallow waters, and typically inhabit marshes and swamps. In these areas they are of course predators, and will feed on most aquatic life that they can fit in their mouths. From 1976 to 1978, 44 of these birds were introduced into Bermuda from the nearby Caribbean. The birds were hand-fed the native crabs, and this taught the night herons to hunt the land crabs in the wild. For the most part this introduction was a success, because they controlled the land crab numbers, and even though they were once abundant, today they are now becoming quite uncommon. This means that this bird could have done too good a job, and the balance is teetering in the other direction. These birds can have some negative impacts on the ecosystem, mainly by competing with other birds, but as they are so closely related to the extinct Bermuda night heron, for the most part this introduction has been a success, and they are beneficial to the Bermudan ecosystem. But for our next introduced species, we will be heading over to North America, as we have the honeybee. Now honeybees are some of the most loved insects on this planet, both because they can be very cute, and also because they're very beneficial for farming. Although you can find honeybees throughout most of the world today, they were originally only native to Africa and Eurasia. They arrived in South America in the early 16th century, Australia in the early 19th century, and North America in the early 17th century. These bees arrived in North America from Europe, and they were of course introduced by humans. Their introduction might have seemed like a good idea to the settlers, but it had negative impacts on the native bees. There are plenty of native North American bees, and when the honeybees arrived, they directly competed 
with these native bees. It's of course had a negative effect on their numbers, and this is part of the reason why some people view them as invasive in North America. But even though honeybees were bad news for the native bees, they were very good news for the people of North America. Famously, honeybees are very good pollinators, and in a single year, one honeybee colony can gather around 18 kilograms of pollen. This means that they can really help crop yields, and it's thought that in the US alone, honeybees increase crop values by around $15 billion each year. This of course makes them very important for the economy, but the native bees are also great pollinators. The bees native to the US are also used in agriculture, and some of the crops that they pollinate include squash, tomatoes, cherries, blueberries, and cranberries. There are pros and cons that come with using native bees and also honeybees. But in recent years, honeybee populations in the US have been declining, and this could mean that more native bees would have to take over. And even though honeybees do help with farming, the native bees also do a very good job. But for our final species, we will be staying in North America, but we will be heading over to California, as we have the Spartina. Now, Spartina is a plant in the grass family, and is frequently found in coastal salt marshes. In some areas, they are commonly known as cord grass, but the cord grasses I will be focusing on today aren't native to California. They are often found along the coasts of the Atlantic Ocean, mostly in Western and South Europe, and also the Atlantic coast of North America, and also South America. These grasses often form large, dense colonies, and grow very quickly in tidal areas. These grasses are very much invasive in California, as they easily outcompete and outgrow native grasses. It was thought to be first introduced into Humboldt Bay in the 19th century, and this was from lumber ships that had arrived from Chile. Their seeds are able to spread by floating on water, and this means that they can spread over large distances. California does have its own native cord grass, but the invasive grass is known as Chilean cord grass. These cord grasses also often hybridize, so some of the native grasses will hybridize with the invasive grasses. This meant that in some areas of California, these invasive grasses were taking over, and this was bad news for the native wildlife. Many of California's wetland animals rely on these native grasses, and the invasive grasses are completely wiping them out. California is home to a threatened wetland bird that's known as Ridgeway's rail. This bird was once thought to be a subspecies of clapper rail, but is now recognized as its own species. This wetland bird rarely flies, and lives and nests in the wetlands of California. It can often be seen foraging on mudflats, and they often prod the substrate as they go. This helps them to locate their prey, which in most cases comes in the form of mussels, clams, and worms. Today it is listed as near threatened, and this is mainly due down to habitat destruction and urban development. Strangely, the invasive grasses are beneficial to this bird, as they will use these grasses as a place to nest. This has created even more problems, because the government wants to control the invasive grasses, but they also want to protect and help these birds. As these grasses are beneficial to these birds, it's impossible to remove them, and although they do cause many problems for the native plants, they do help out this plucky little bird. If you know of any other species that could have made it on this list, then let me know down in the comments below. But thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.